Hello, everyone. Guillaume Nitzvah here, host of the E-Commerce Wizards podcast, where I feature top leaders in e-commerce and business. And today's guest is Sean Joel, who's a very accomplished entrepreneur. He co-founded DALS Lighting and built this up to an eight-figure business. And now he sort of distanciated uh, took some distance from that business and he's now a coach, a business coach, and he's using the uh, scaling up methodology as a certified scale up uh, coach. And this is a, a technique that for which I have great respect because I, I just love the stuff from Vern Harnish, very famous book, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. And then the second version came up, the update version uh, called Scaling Up. So this is a methodology that he's implanted in his previous business and that he's now coaching, obviously. So we're, we're going to have a very interesting talk today probably a bit about a lot of stuff uh, on how to improve a business. And from my personal experience, when I'm helping e-commerce merchants, even though, yes, we help with uh, digital strategy, digital transformation, how to send more traffic, conversion rate optimization, and, and you know all kind of automation work, it often comes down to the entrepreneur being in his own way. And that's what's really preventing the business from growing rather than the fact that it's an e-commerce, which is sometimes secondary to what needs to really be addressed. So here, I believe we'll have a great talk with a focus on, on scaling up from seven figure to eight figures and various other topics. Now, before we get started, I have two more things to do. First, I want to give a shout out to John Corcoran of Rice25 Media for introducing us. Otherwise, this podcast will, will not be happening today. And the second thing is our sponsorship message. This episode is brought to you by Mage Montreal. If a business wants a powerful e-commerce online store that will increase their sales, or to move piled up dormant inventory to free up cash reserves, or to automate business processes to gain efficiency and reduce human processing errors, or a company, Mage Montreal can do that. We've been helping e-commerce stores for over a decade. Here's a catch. We're specialized in only work on the Adobe Magento e-commerce platform. We do everything Magento. You, need, you know someone who needs design, development, maintenance, training, support, new website, we got their back. Email or team support at magemontreal.com or go to magemontreal.com. That's M-A-G-E, Montreal.com. All right, Sean, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me, Guillaume. So can you tell us a little bit about you before we get started? Absolutely. I have a very uh, different background than most people would expect. I actually studied documentary filmmaking at university. Uh, you know, I was going to change the world, talk about social, political, economic issues, a lot to do with racism and arranged marriages. And when I came out of university, that lasted approximately one month. And I realized, you know what? This industry, there's no money to be made. It's really challenging. And I was given an opportunity by a friend to work for a company called Rubbermaid. I'm sure your listeners have heard of this. You probably have a garbage can at home or a shed or some type of Rubbermaid product. Sharpie pens, those are all owned by Rubbermaid as well. And so I started working as a sales rep for this company. Did that for four years. And the reason I mentioned it is that it was the most amazing leadership school anybody could ever go through. I was flown to Dallas and to Aspen and to Atlanta, and to Phoenix, and we were given leadership training and, you know, really learning how to be the best salespeople and the best leaders uh, in North America. They really took care of us young university grads uh, to teach us the ropes. And four years after that, you know, I, I did a district manager job in the company. The family business came to me and said, you know what? We want you to join the family business. And this was my in-laws, father-in-law, mother-in-law, and brother-in-law. They had started a lighting company. At that time, it wasn't even LED. You know, it was that long ago. It was in the, they started in 1999. They recruited me in 2004. Uh, and so I went into this uh, LED lighting business that my father-in-law was growing exponentially fast. He had taken a bankrupt company and he put it on the TSX stock exchange, which is actually very bizarre because the company was bankrupt. No one understood how he did it. No one understands even today how he pulled that <laughs> off. Uh, and he grew the business from 1999 to 2007. He took it from zero to 50 million in revenue. Uh, so a very amazing success story in Quebec. It was all mergers and acquisitions. Unfortunately, in 2008, when the recession hit, there was a bad company purchase made and the company came crumbling down. It wasn't able to sustain the recession. And at that time, my brother-in-law and I had a choice to make. We decided to basically buy back three divisions and start from scratch. And that's where we started our company, Dallas Lighting, which is an LD lighting company. So it's been 12 years uh, that we're doing that business. And it's uh, still going strong today. Well, congrats. An interesting uh, story. And yes, I don't know how you were able to list on a TSX, a bankrupt business. So <laughs> it's totally, totally it, bizarre. It, it probably had the, the, the danger watch sign that appears on, on business that don't do their filing on time. Or something. 100%. <laughs> right. <clears throat> okay. 
So let's get started here. Let's say what is top of mind for you when we want to help an e-commerce merchant going from seven figure to eight figure. You know, we're, we're looking at this and, you know, you and I were speaking about this in the past. There's e-commerce business, there's overall business. You know, there's going to be things that are very specific to e-commerce businesses and the way they function and how automated things need to be and, you know, to be that, have that online presence. At the same time, I also truly believe that there's business fundamentals that need to be put in place into every single business. And you can't get away without having these in place. And a lot of times, seven-figure businesses won't have necessarily as many of the tools in place as eight-figure businesses. So what we came to realize along our growth was a couple of very key things. No matter what happens, uh, culture will eat any other part of your business for breakfast. So you need to be building a world-class culture in your organization if you want to get anything accomplished. From our story, we had three businesses that we purchased. We inherited all the people from those businesses. And as we were growing and implementing the Rockefeller habits, we came to realize, wait a second, there's a lot of people in these businesses that don't fit. You know, that are not living our core values, don't understand what we're trying to do as a business, don't believe in the vision, don't believe in the alignment. And we ended up changing 85% of our team. So we have 50 employees. There's only about seven people left from the initial group of 50 that we had. All of the others are brand new people that we switched and brought in. And it sounds dramatic and it sounds like a lot, but we had no choice because we started realizing as we were changing people and bringing in, you know, what we consider to be called A players or promoters, as we like to call them in our business. It was very obvious for us that these people were much more talented. They were much bigger and better in terms of believing in company culture and following the vision that we were setting for them. And other people who weren't on the bandwagon, well, you know, unfortunately, they didn't make it along the way. You know, for us, I would say that would be the number one lesson that was learned from it. You have to have the right people in the right seats. You have to work on culture first. You know, and Jim Collins, for, for those listeners, I'm sure they, they heard of him before, of course, you know, from good to great and built to last. That's what Jim... Collins always says, right, first who, then what, you know, I think that's the number one step of any business trying to go from seven to eight figures. Even if you're going to be very automated along the way, your core team, no matter how big or small it is, has to be the right people steering in the right direction. Great. It makes a lot of sense. So I guess you, you probably vet them some system, like, uh, do they want it? Do they get it? Can they do it? Something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're thinking the EOS. Uh, which yeah, the EOS, uh, which is a spin-off of scaling up. Uh, yeah, exactly. They're, they're very similar and they're, they're both amazing yeah. systems that work very well. But yes, yeah. you know, I you know, I help my clients implement very specific ways of working, which is a hiring process, which is a little more detailed than people are used to. But what we really focus on are success metrics and KPIs, right? Which are your e-commerce uh, clients will love to talk about. You know, you have to be measuring data, you have to be ensuring that you're hitting the targets and goals that you set for yourselves which shockingly, a lot of companies don't do, believe it or not. But even when you're building what we call a scorecard at the beginning to hire new people, you have to talk about success. What does success look for them look like for them in six months? And what does it look like for them in 12 months? And you need to make it a story as if they've already accomplished it. You know, so in the case of a, an e-commerce business, it would be, okay, listen, you've already got the new e-commerce store up and running. You've built key partner relationships with all the suppliers and you've all the signed contracts. But you're, you're explaining it in the future tense as if they've already done it. So when that potential candidate reads that job description, they look at it and they say, wow, they've given me a roadmap to exactly what I need to accomplish. And then you back that up with very specific KPIs. You know, what are going to be the KPIs that are measured for their success? So I think that piece is often something that's missed in organizations and that's made a huge difference for us. Yeah, I agree. With that. So that you want everybody to have their numbers is that I'm hearing here. <laughs> Which is can which can be hard to find even sometime, or you may not have the proper data or reporting system in place in the company to even be able to that each employee has a key number that they can look at, like let's say daily to know how they're doing. And I guess we just fall back to okay, let's have a number for maybe quarterly performance or something like that. But it doesn't stir you as much daily, day to day. Did I have a great day or not? Yeah, I agree. And you know, you're right, Guillaume. It does need to be automated. It needs to be easy to find. If you're in a company and you can't pull out the numbers the right way, chances are you're not measuring what you're doing. If you're not measuring it, how are you going to improve it? How are you going to be better as an organization? So even for smaller companies, I'd highly recommend get on top of your numbers. That's the number one thing we see going into businesses. They don't have a good grasp on their cash. They don't understand if they're making money or not making money. They're not able to measure, you know, what they're accomplishing as goals, especially from a team member, a team member perspective. So you got to give them those tools. You got to make sure that they have ways of measuring those KPIs. And you know, if anybody's ever heard of a website called kpilibrary.com, 
there's actually about 40,000 KPIs. So if you're never sure what you should be measuring, just go to kpilibrary.com. And uh, don't worry, I'm not, I'm not a sponsor for that website or anything. I was just pretty impressed that they put all the KPIs that exist on the planet in one place. So it's a pretty cool place to look. Right, yeah, it's good for inspiration. But then, of course, I believe you, you want to keep things simple for the employee. Like they say that the employee needs the, the scoreboard, a bit like a, a hockey game or something like that. It has to be super simple, just one or a few metrics. And then you can have the manager or the coach's scoreboard that can have way more metrics if you want to. I completely agree with you. You know, for us in our business, we had a bit more of a manufacturing business to it, although we did quite a bit of e-commerce as well. And it applies as much to e-commerce as it does to, you know, brick and mortar. We have a number of orders we have to ship out every day, right? So, you know, people seem to forget a lot of times that an e-commerce business, you have product that still deliver, yeah, uh, even yeah. if you're, you're e-commerce. And so we had something called the OTAC, which is the on-time and complete ratio. So what it would mean is what percentage of orders are we shipping both on time and complete? And so our goal was to be anywhere between 92 and 93 percent. And people ask me, well, why not 100 percent? Well, you have to know that when you're in a business, if you have inventory on the shelves, if you just blast your inventory to ridiculous levels, of course, you can be at 100 percent OTAC, but you're probably going to go out of business because you're probably going to have way too much inventory, no more cash flow. And what happens if you make a bad purchase or two, you have the wrong thing on the shelves for your clients. So you have to have that balance between being able to ship enough product, but also having the right mix of that product along the way. You know, the way we always measured it, we said to ourselves, let's say a client orders 20 products from you on one order, and then you deliver 19 out of those 20. Well, for us, that's not a 95% hit rate. For us, that is literally 0% because now you've left out one product. And no matter what, that client's still going to be annoyed, right? Because they only got 19 you know, out of 20 items. There's still something very important that they're missing there. Yeah, so for yeah, us, yeah. that's how we measure it. Exactly. The, if you... Even for small orders, like if say a restaurant delivery is big these days, Uber Eat and whatnot, skip the dishes. If you forgot somebody's meal at the table, you know, like it's not fine 19 out of 20 on the delivery. That's not exactly. fine. That's a great um, example. I know I had a really bad experience the other night with, with an Uber Eats where, you know, Uber, they, you know, I live in a Bay Durfee and it's an area where there's not a lot of restaurants near me. I've been using Uber Eats for a few things and I ordered some in Uber Eats and they said, you know, Gonna get to you between 7:30 and 7:50, and I was like, okay, that's an hour, but they're telling me a time frame. It's totally respectable. Food ended up showing up at 8:20, you know, and so the food showed up literally an hour later than their earliest time, and you know, just about uh, 30 minutes later than their longest time, and it was completely cold, right? And I thought to myself, what a failure in this platform, which had a driver, and they're telling me it's going to be connected to me at the right time. But realistically, the algorithm should have told me, listen, we're not going to get your food to you for an hour and a half if you still want it, right? Right. It wasn't done that. And I became a very angry and frustrated customer. So it's another lesson learned. Be sure you're delivering on what you promise, right? Yeah, angry and hungry, for sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's say we started on the people component. Do you want to deep dive more on the people component here? Uh, like, Okay, I, sure. I want to have the, the best team there is. Everybody knows that. But how do we go about it? The, the hiring system that we've been using is just, you know, foolproof. Honestly, we've taken companies that do anywhere between hiring 10 and 30% A players. Now we're at about a 92% hit rate. What happens is when you're building and you're recruiting the right way, there's a lot of key things you have to do that I see a lot of companies are not doing. First of all, you really have to take time to build what we call that scorecard, right? So not only your success metrics, you have to have your top five responsibilities, key competencies, everything you need. When you're building your job description, it's a bit of a selling tool. So you need to have the DNA of the company, you know, your company core values, what your company is all about, what their role is all about. A lot of those things have to be very clear and appealing to the person right at the beginning of the process. When you're going out there and you're recruiting people, where are you going? E-commerce companies have a bit of an advantage, I think, in the sense that these days labor is very tough to find, especially manual labor, which is something that's disappearing. You know, If you have more office or people that are you know, finding themselves on LinkedIn, there are so many creative ways right now to go out and hire these people. You know, just LinkedIn Recruiter, how amazing it has become over the last couple of months is blowing my mind completely. You know, we put up a job recently for a digital marketing coordinator, and we received 228 applications in four days. And it cost us, by the way, $202. Uh, right. So you know, it was incredibly inexpensive. We had an amazing bank of candidates, and you know, it, it was just a great experience overall. Once you start getting these CVs in, then your process really starts. And the question is, what are you going to do and what do you have as a process 
again, most companies I meet don't have a very good process. They just start interviewing and they hope to find the best candidate. We really recommend doing the interview process in multiple steps. First, you want to filter to make sure that you're filtering out the people that make no sense for your business. You want to have a quick Zoom in interview, 15 minutes. You're asking key questions like, what are you good at professionally? What are you not good at? You know, don't ask the biggest weaknesses because everybody answers the same thing. You know, they're perfectionists and they're workaholics. That's the only answer you could ever give to that. But you really want to ask, what are you not interested in doing? And then you want to get the salary expectations. Because why are you waiting to get that information till the end? If you're only willing to pay someone $50,000 a year and they want a hundred, the conversation's over, right? So you need to be clear on your expectations and on their expectations. Then we like to push companies to have an in-person interview. It could be by Zoom these days. We know that's not as easy. But then what we recommend is doing team interview, okay, where you would have four different people from your company meet this individual, two people at a time. And why is that important? It's important because if you want to protect your culture and you want to protect your values, you cannot have only one person hiring the candidate. You absolutely need to have multiple people who already live your culture and believe in what you're doing meet this candidate. And by having four other A players meet the candidate and talk about different key subjects, you get a very better, you get a much better understanding if that person fits your values and cultures. And then the last thing we like to really push is doing a position specific test. Okay. Because what happens is people always say that they're really great at everything that they do, but are we testing them before we hire them? So if you're going to hire somebody, for example, again, this example of our digital, digital marketing coordinator, we ended up with four really strong candidates at the end. And we asked them and said, you know what? Go back home. We're going to give you four days. Put together a digital marketing plan for the next 12 months. It could be as long or as short as you want, as detailed as you want, graphics, no graphics, we don't care. You put together what you think is best for our business. And can you imagine the differences in quality that we got? We got four different PDFs back, and one of them was just amazing. You know, two were mediocre, one was terrible. But that person who had put together the most amazing PDF, they weren't even quite the first choice. But then by giving them the test, we realized yeah, right. this person is going to be amazing. Yeah, so I think hands, on, yeah. hands on work for sure. I, I agree with that. And at the same time, there's always that gray zone. Like you don't want to ask free labor or not too much, but you know, it has to be something reasonable or sometimes we'll, we'll just like pay them a little gig, especially for programmers that say, we, well, we'll pay them a, a useless job. It's a test. We give the same to everybody, like four hour test. Yeah. We pay you up to four hours to do this job and just send it back and we'll analyze the quality of the work and like the responsiveness and how fast do you send it back? And did you answer the messages? Did you follow instructions? Did you deliver the way the instructions were saying? Or did you do something else? Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's a great idea. You could pay them for that. I've seen companies bring in an employee for a whole day to work and pay them for the whole day. If it went well, they'll keep them. And if it didn't, you know, they move on. But I think yeah, the testing exactly. is... is a- that's yeah, I agree with that. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge difference. And the, the methodology you're talking about is that upgrading? It's a, it's, it comes from top grading, it comes from who we've adapted it because both those methodologies are too heavy. Uh, if you go through top grading, they want you to measure 50 different competencies per candidate. I think that's way over the top. You know, I don't think you need to go that far. You know, they do talk a little bit about testing, but we've integrated that on our end in our own system. So yeah, there's a, it's inspired by them, but I think it's what we'd like to call a lighter version. Yeah, we do a lighter version of both as well. Yeah, upgrading the uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Very interesting one. Okay. So you, you better filtering at the hiring process, which is of course critical, but then often you just don't know how much that, how well that person would perform until you see work. So if there's, if it's possible to have a small test, like you were saying, the marketing test, that's amazing. Or sometimes we, we pay for a small test, let's say for developers, because it's very different. Like developers, we have to hunt them one by one. That's While true. when you post a job, let's say a project manager, you get 200 CVs. You know, yeah. so it's a very different reality. Um, <clears throat> but after that, there are more complex positions, let's say more like executive types of position that you cannot expect the person to sort of deliver you anything concrete or clear. And they first need to learn the business and all that. There's the huge onboarding process. And like, do you have any uh, personal story there on how to better hire, let's say, at the executive level? Executive level, you know, a lot of times there's going to be it usually is more in depth homework. Well, often we've asked, for example, we were hiring a VP sales. We've asked that person to come back or a few of those people to come back and actually give us a full presentation, you know, where we said, listen, you have to give us like your whole sales methodology, the way you're going to do it for us. And the thing is the top people in the market, the top players, the ones that are really good at what they do, they love these type of process because they realize that a company is structured. They see it's serious. 
and they want to win the job. So for them, they actually put a lot of effort into it because they say, you know what, this company is really serious. I want to impress them. I want to show them that, you know, I'm going to be able to win this process and come out on top. And so often we'll see even more effort made by these individuals. But that definitely the process works at all levels. When you start getting into more entry level positions, you can eliminate a couple of steps. But as much at the mid level, all the way to the executive level, it is a very similar process. It's just you can start layering on, you know, a little bit more intensity, if you want to call it that way, to make sure that you're really vetting the right way. So the, the, the scaling up system, if I recall correctly, has four pillars. You have people, strategy, execution, and cash. Do you want to deep dive more into people or do you want to move up to another pillar? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the last thing I'll say to you on people is that um, when you're building an amazing culture, it's not good enough just to hire. You have to think about a few other things. So when you're bringing on these amazing people, you have to have an amazing onboarding and integration program. So I'd highly recommend companies think about that. I've almost seen no companies truly onboard and integrate the right people, uh, people the right way. So when they start working, you know, are you giving them some swag? Are you introducing them to all the people in the business? Are you taking them out to lunch with their department or their colleagues? Are you giving them a six-week, eight-week, 10-week training plan to make sure that they integrate perfectly into their role? These are all things that you need to think about. Most of the time we see people, they're given a computer and they're like, good luck. You know, here's a company handbook, figure it out. You know, that's not going to motivate a person on the long run. You really have to make sure that you integrate them the right way. You know, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Jack. If you've ever heard of Jack Daly, who's like no. a sales guru, but Jack Daly, when he gives his conferences, he always laughs. He says, we have huge parties that are going away parties. So when people are leaving the company or leaving the business or retiring or whatever it is, you have this big party. Like, why aren't we having big parties when a new employee starts? That should be a celebration. You know, you're bringing in this new person into the business. You know, why don't we celebrate their arrival? So that's another really key part. And then there's something that I like to call systematic recognition which means that every single quarter, you should be looking at the composition of your team and looking at those high performers that are not only amazing on productivity, but that are also great value fits. The best way to test this is if you imagine having a human cloning machine, and if you could clone that human being, would you be willing to do it? You know, would you be able to take Guillaume, stick him into the cloning machine and have a million Guillaumes running around the office? That's your test to know if that person is really you know, an A player and so you want to be recognizing those people on a quarterly basis. And when I say recognizing, it doesn't have to be financial. You could be offering them, you know, uh, a card signed by the entire strategic leadership team, thanking them, saying, you know, Guillaume, you've been amazing over the last 90 days. You do such great work all the time. You're engaged. You're committed. And we just want to let you know we, it means a lot and you're a very key part of the team. You know, giving something like that to someone makes a huge difference in how they're feeling appreciated in the business. So that's the last thing on the people side. I would say it's not good enough to just hire. Think about onboarding, integration, training, leadership, and especially recognition, which is huge. I agree. Yeah, they need to feel uh, like they belong, that you appreciate uh, the work. And of course, that has to be genuine. Otherwise, you, you have the wrong, the wrong person there. And one thing I'll add to this is we, we added um, an LMS, the learning management system, that has like a structured video for the onboarding. And that's not enough the video. You must have a quiz as well, because otherwise you don't know if they watched it or if they watched it, they, they might not have watched it with much attention. But and then as soon as you you know there's a quiz, then oh, and then the second video you'll pay way more attention so that you perform in the quiz and you get a score. Love so uh, <clears throat> I think that works well. Great idea. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's move on. Uh, which of the next pillar do you want to talk about? Scaling well, you know, we seven to eight. Yeah, it does go in a little bit of an order, you know, and the, the order of people always starts first. And then we'd like to move on to strategy. So strategy really comes down to what is your strategy, both long term and short term. You have to have both figured out quite early in your journey. So when we come into businesses, we like to work what we call on the fundamental parts of the business first, which are core values, your why, so your reason for existing. And then we'd like to jump into the BHAG. So if people don't know what that term is, that's your big, hairy, audacious goal. What is it that you want to accomplish in 10, 15, 20 years from now? And I can tell you, Guillaume, this is one of the most challenging things that we do when we get into businesses. They really struggle to figure out that long-term, you know, big, hairy, audacious goal that's scary, that's motivating, that's inspiring, and that's non-financial. A lot of entrepreneurs can easily come up with a number. But when you start asking them to come up with a goal that's non-financial, it's much more challenging. And it has to be measurable. A lot of times we'll hear companies say, we just want to be the leader. I say, what does that mean? being the leader. How are you going to measure that you're the leader? It doesn't really mean anything, right? So you got to figure out a way to have that big area that's just goal determined in a very different way. 
And then typically we'll deep dive into everything that's core sandbox. So we want to know, you know, who are your core clients? Who is it that you're going after? How are you going to sell to them? You know, are you going to have sales reps? It's going to be internal. It's going to be external. It's going to be marketing, branding. And we like to ask, what are you going to sell? What are your services? Are you developing a software? You know, is it going to be through e-commerce? Is it all going to be online? Is there going to be, you know, a brick and mortar aspect to your business? Well, those are all the key things that we like to go through really carefully. And then we like to usually end that strategy part on brand promises. We really like to push companies into having a brand promise with guarantee. So, you know, the big difference is not just telling someone, you know what, if you work with us, you're going to receive exceptional service or, or what? Is there a consequence if I don't get exceptional service? Now you've told me I'm going to get exceptional service. Right. So a brand promise doesn't mean anything unless you can back it up. And so we teach clients, you know, how to ensure that they're implementing not just a promise, but also something that's going to be, you know, respected and guaranteed along the way. And the brand promise can make a huge difference. You differentiate yourself from the market and all that. Uh, creates a bit of stress to put in place. And then it's difficult sometimes to, to, to have one brand promise like that. But I agree. This is a, this is a good point. And strategy is it's very challenging because there's a lot there. This is, this is a loaded topic. It's more crafty. It's more fine. And then there's all the tactics after that, how you're going to apply that strategy because you can have that grand vision and how you're actually going to do it and how you will people execute on it. But um, just uh, the strategy layer, I mean, is there anything else perhaps from your own personal experience that you'd like to share? Maybe a strategy you've put in place or a change of strategy or strategy that didn't work or anything like that? Yeah, Liz, the, you're totally right. You know, the strategy part is very heavy. And if you get the strategy wrong, you could be going at a thousand miles an hour in the wrong direction, right? Uh, which people think sometimes they're working really hard. They don't understand why the business isn't working. Well, it's because their strategies are wrong. You can work as hard as you want, but you're going to be literally putting your business in the ground. So, you know, what, what I like to do is I like to work with strategic teams because I feel like sometimes just the CEO might not have always all the answers, right? We think that we always do as the main entrepreneurs, but it's really good to have a strong team around you and have that collaboration. So we like to have the whole team working on strategy at the same time. That usually gives different perspectives. You know, the VP ops might be different than a director of sales, might be different than a controller. They're all going to bring a different angle and a different image. So I think it's really important to really have all those different opinions in the room and be open-minded enough to hear those different uh, ideas, because I think that's usually where the breakthroughs can happen. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, strategy, um, you got to you gotta stop overthinking. You know, sometimes people try to just overthink it and try to go really complicated and do things. You know, we like to come in and say, let's just start by building a clear strategy. Let's not go complicated. Let's not go too detailed. Let's just get, you know, to the, to the picture of what you're trying to accomplish. Let's just make sure that the vision is clear for everyone in the organization. And let's take it from there. And usually we're able to, you know, in our first couple of days together, really nail down and, and get all the details sorted out. But it takes time. You know, in our LED lighting business, as an example, we changed our big area audacious goal five times in five years. So every year we would we'd build one. And then the next year we'd get back to our annual meeting. We'd say, wait a second, I think that was the wrong one. I think we screwed this up. And so we'd have to revamp it and rework it and start from scratch. So it is a work in progress. I always tell people, you know, you're not going to do something, build it and put it on the shelf and think that's going to be there forever. You have to be ready to adapt and be ready to, to change because along the way, things will be different. Well, unless you pick like go on Mars as your behalf or something. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there you go. That's, yeah. that's a good one. Yeah, okay. And uh, let's say again, for the e-commerce aspect, uh, sometimes I see it tends to be more simple business, but if it's B2C, but sometimes I see the business model to be slightly broken or clunky. Mm -hmm to say that, uh, okay, it's operational. Like if you get to seven figure, you have an, a functional, some degree business model and strategy, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's slick and, and smooth. And very often I feel they're, they're clunky and there's, there's missing a few key elements. Sometimes those key elements can be as simple as a loyalty program, especially mm -hmm. if you're a retailer, let's say, because you're selling the same stuff as everybody else. So in a way, it's almost like how much are you willing to to not bribe, but to give to your customer to acquire that customer because you know he can buy the same product at the other store as well. It's it's, it's a retail store, so yes. that that can be a, a critical aspect the loyalty program in, into driving growth, for example, in those kind of consumer retail stores. I so totally that, agree. Yeah, yeah. There's so many different ways to look at it, I and mean, you got to get creative. 
you know, and I know it's not directly e-commerce necessarily related, but you look at a company like Costco, right? We take it for granted now that we're paying, you know, $50 or $100, depending what kind of membership that you have at Costco. Now, Costco brings in over $3 billion a year in bottom line profit, profit, not revenue, profit, just from their membership program. And that was something they thought about outside the box, right? It wasn't something that existed. When Costco first opened, it wasn't on a membership. You could just go in. And then one day they said, you know what? We should start charging people to come into this place. And it really Which is amazing out. if you think about it. Like, imagine a startup store or startup e-commerce store th- that you would charge people to be able to come in your store. Like people are, are on the country, especially if it's a startup situation, they're desperate for traffic and visitors and buyers, you know? So that they're switching the table here. They're flipping the table on, on the customer. And yeah. what I was reading also is that Costco can self finance each new Costco just through the the the, the membership sale of the previous Costco so they don't, don't need the, the bank leverage financing as much so it, it's really brilliant what they're doing <laughs> with that membership card it doesn't seem like much that hey that $100 membership card but that's i don't remember the exact number i think it was driving like half their yearly profits or something like that yeah, yeah. so it, okay. it's it's huge it's it's like it's genius Yeah, and I think we could look at other examples out there. You know, there's a lot of companies now that are getting into these, you know, a lot of e-commerce companies that are forcing you into certain memberships. And you got to build your name. You got to have an amazing reputation. Obviously, I was buying furniture the other day and there was a company called Restoration Hardware. Uh, if anybody's ever heard of that, it's a very, very nice website. Beautiful, beautiful, high quality uh, furniture pieces. Uh, but they give you two prices, right? They say, okay, it's going to cost you $3,000 at the regular price. But if you come in as a member, You know, where you have to only pay, I think it was like $200 or something for the year. You know, that that furniture is going to go down from $3,000 to like $2,400. So you're right away. It was a no-brainer, but it's like, wait a second, are they tricking me? They're getting me to pay $200 of a membership. And would I really have to pay this regular price? So they, they figured out a model as well where they're getting all these people to pay a membership fee and come back and think, well, now that I have this membership, I can keep buying these at discounted prices. But really, you know, everybody's buying the membership. So of course, nobody's yeah. going to buy the three thousand dollar option. Exactly. You know, so there's like, a lot of ways to think about it. It feels like is it even an honest price? Like a three thousand? You know, like did they just bump up the price to make it obvious that I need to buy a membership? I don't know. Yeah, I know that's where it's tricky. But you, we can't know, right? Because we're not behind the scene. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so strategy. Did you see any kind of great example of strategy that comes to mind? Uh, there's, there's many, now I got to be careful to say one that's not the proprietary to, to some of my right. clients or, right. uh, but I think there's a lot of amazing models. There's a, if you look right now, one of our biggest clients that we were helping a lot for strategy is a dialogue health, uh, mm-hmm. which is not quite e-commerce, but it's telemedicine and it's obviously yeah. all an online platform and, you know, just the way it's worth for people to go check it out and see and read about their story because they just recently IPO, uh, one of the biggest IPOs in, in history of Quebec, uh, you know, they had a hundred million dollars of, of, of stock requests just from family had a billion dollars in overall stock requests. Uh, so, I mean, that's just unbelievable in, in an initial IPO launch. Uh, and they, you know, they've revamped the entire medical experience, you know, strategically speaking on how you go speak to a doctor or a nurse you know, and they're hiring all these doctors and nurses directly internally. So it's, it's really, if you think about how crazy that really is of hiring all these doctors, all these nurses directly into your organization to be speaking directly to you know, that end user of the application. And they've really redefined an entire medical industry by the way they've gone out and, and built their platform and built their, their online system. So, you know, I think there's a lot of ways to do it. There's a lot of ways you can be disruptive. I'm not saying you have to be disruptive because sometimes companies get lost in disruption as well. Sometimes you just want to be the best in class. But there's, you know, you got you to be working on that strategy all the time. Yeah, that I'm, well, we have dialogue here in the company. It's amazing. It's, and it's yeah. not that expensive. And it's a it's a revolution for the the medical industry. Otherwise, you would always have to go to the clinic. There's sometimes there's no space, or even you say you call at seven in the morning, and very often you cannot even have the line. And then they say, uh, "Sorry, uh, no more space today if it's the no appointment uh, clinic." You know, so yes. uh, like with this, the the sole the, the resource management system in a way because you have doctors that are available, but they're remote up north or something like that. So with telemedicine. You know, you have access to the whole staff, everybody everywhere in the whole country can be providing medical services if they are available. So you, you, 
it's, it's wonderful. Then you have the, the whole country's resources available to just say dispatch from anywhere in the country to serve somebody, a potential patient. Of course, Absolutely. you still need to go in person to, to some clinic for some problems, but it, yeah. it's wonderful. Like I've used it for my, my, my two kids. So I'm really, agree, really, yeah. really happy to have that. Yeah, it's amazing. And that was like, a, you can imagine, you can imagine the discussions we were having as a group in there and talking about how we we're going to, you know, design the strategy around it. But at the end of the day, it was really about creativity and understanding where the medical market was going and really ensuring that we adapted to it. A lot of regulations, right? You have to work with government as well. So it wasn't easy to do, but again, it was that whole thinking outside the box, really taking your strategy to a whole level where no one else has thought about, you know, again, it's not for everyone, right? I like no, to, I like to mention that because not every business has to be a disruptor. Not everybody has to be a dialogue. Not everybody has to be an Uber. Not everybody has to be an Apple. A lot of us aspire towards that, but as a business owner, especially of a small to medium, you know, an SME business, uh, I don't think you should be obsessed with trying to be a disruptor. Your strategy might just be, you know what? We could offer the exceptional service and the highest quality, and we're going to beat all our competition because no one's offering that today. Maybe that's all you need to do as a business, but you need to determine that as a strategy. And the one most important thing I would say is stop trying to be good at everything. Okay, Entrepreneurs have this, you know, and I have it in my blood too, but you want to be the best price, best service, best quality, best technology, best innovation, best automation. You cannot do it all. I'm telling you right now, you need to pick your battles. You need to pick what you're going to be really good at and, you know, make those your brand promises as a company. And then what Frances Frey talks about in her book, Uncommon Service, the great book to read, she talks about anti-brand promises. You know, tell clients, you know what? If you're looking for the cheapest price, don't come to us. Like, we will never be the cheapest price. And don't be shy about saying that because you can tell them, but we will be the best quality or the best service and you won't find that elsewhere. So make your decision. If you want the cheapest price, go to the comp competition. You want to be, you know, served the right way and you want to ensure that your e-commerce site is working the right way or you're getting the right type of, you know, uh, automation from us. Well, come with us and we guarantee that part of the business. So I think we need to make trade-offs and decisions as companies, which we often don't like. To make. Very good point. And to be a disruptor, you quickly need to be extremely well capitalized, which is the case for Dialogue. I don't know how many millions they have in capital, but it's, it's, it's huge, people backing this. So. Because you can say, how else could you possibly hire all those doctors and those specialists and nurses? They're almost opening a private hospital there, you know, <laughs> and then they make it virtually available to everybody. So it's like, it's pretty crazy what they're doing. Yeah, um, yeah so that's very large capital stuff. Okay, so strategy, really good. Uh, anything else on strategy or do you want to move on to execution? I think we're good to move on to execution. All right. Okay. <laughs> So, you know, when we're talking about execution, what is execution? There's a lot of different elements to execution. Number one is we like to say, do it once, do it well, right? So making sure that you're setting yourself up for success in everything that you do the right way. And another big part of it is picking the right priorities. So again, this idea of trying to do too many things at once, to be really good at execution, you have to limit how much you're doing. Because the more you do and the wider you make that scope, the more mediocre you'll be at everything that you do. So what you need to do is say, okay, what are the key things that we need to work on as an organization? Go all in on those one, two, or three things on an annual and quarterly basis, but stop trying to do everything. You know, again, we see this all the time. Speak to companies that are trying to do everything at once. Another big pillar that we like to talk about in, in execution is lean. So for, you know, I think some of your audience will know what lean is. The lean methodology comes from Toyota, comes from Japan. The meaning of lean really means eliminating any waste that is not bringing value directly to the customer. So when you look at your processes, are you doing certain things that are just a waste of time that is not bringing value to your customer? And a lot of times you ask companies, why are you doing this? Well, it's, it's always been done this way. They well, wait a sec, you know, that's not a good answer. It's always been done this way. What are we gonna do to change it? Should we be doing things differently? And so you need to encourage people to think like that and say, you know what, let's not accept the status quo. Maybe it needs improving. And so we like to ensure that companies are really going through that process improvement. It's called continuous improvement that we're doing all the time. We'll even often create a committee in the company called the Lean Committee, where every month the Lean Committee will look in the company and say, what are the things that we can improve, reduce cost on, reduce waste on, and bring immediate return on investment, so immediate ROI and profit back into the business. And it's stunning how often we can find ideas. You know, I saw a company save tens of thousands of dollars by just printing double-sided on a sheet. You know, they're a very, you know, paper-intensive company. And if someone came up with a day, said, why are we printing? Why don't we print double-sided? 
and they realized it ends up costing them, uh, saving them, I think it was about $18,000 a year just on doing that little lean initiative. That's one very basic example. There's so many things you could do. And there's a myth out there that lean is only for manufacturing companies. It's not true. Lean is something that's implemented deep down in every company. You could have lean through any, you know, as simple as a phone call. When a client calls your business or an email comes in, how are you handling it? How are you doing that? You know, are you lean? Are you wasting? You know, are you eliminating any waste along the way that's not helping your client? Mm, right. Uh, yeah, you've covered pretty wide, lots of points. And execution is, is actually where most businesses do or die. You can see a lot of businesses that have, let's say, great execution. And they're, they're, they might be super weak in strategy and other stuff. And they're just like have their nose down and their head down. And they just keep doing day in, day out everything that's hard workers. And sometimes they have great success. But they seem to be missing the big picture for, for some businesses. That, that's one type of profile. The other type of profile tend to have a great uh, big picture, and then the execution is just terrible. So, uh, and, and then you need to find, of course, the right balance and having both. And then you have that that super uh, power that's coming on um, execution for sure. I believe for the majority of the business, it is the number one problem that they will face. Yeah. Uh, if you understand reasonably well your industry, if you start business, you probably had a lay, an angle already or something, or uh, perhaps a satisfaction how things were done. So I'm going to create my business with my own values, and we're going to do things differently and this and that. You probably have an angle from some kind of strategy. Yeah. Execution is where it breaks down. So you've covered some great topics like trying to do less, not trying to be the, the one-stop shop that does way too much stuff. Uh, what else could you say? Let's say a company has an execution problem and they come to you. What would you dive in? I mean, I would dive in, especially in uh, at this day and age where we are. I think you have to look at your systems and technology. You know, where are you at in terms of automation? Where are you at with your systems and technology? A lot of companies are still slow. And on that, I think your audience is a little more, you know, avant-gardist and, and probably a little more advanced on that. But it's shocking how often we go into businesses and even e-commerce businesses that are just not quite up to date to their competition and to what the market has available to them. So, you know, we like to do a big audit and say, okay, is your technology as sophisticated as it can be? Sophisticated yet simple, right? You want to make sure that it, it's not over the top either, but we want to make sure that companies can go out there and review their technology, review their innovation and do an audit and say, okay, what are the next steps that we need to make sure that we're ahead of our competition, ahead of the market on this level? So I think looking for ways to automate, looking for ways to improve, the systems and maybe also looking for ways to merge as we often come into companies now you know they have a crm they have an erp they have something for you know emails they have something separate for their strategy they have just like 10 different platforms and it's like wait a sec are you sure you're as efficient as you can be as a team and as a company because again from an execution standpoint you're probably losing on a lot of steps here so you want to make sure you improve that as quickly as possible yeah for sure with system integration you can I uh, had a customer entering manually 5,000 voices uh, per year from his e-commerce system into his accounting system. Hey, let's fix that right away. You know, <laughs> so I don't worry. See it all the time. Yeah. So, so for sure, having all the system integrated together is one of the challenges, that I believe, of this decade that we're, we're going to keep seeing. The digital transformation has been around for a while. But it's still going to be there for the next 10 years without a problem and over. Um and if you can, of course, having one central system that sort of has everything in one place tends it is ideal, but often those systems tend to have weaknesses because they try to do everything like we were saying a moment ago, and they will go mediocre in some sections. So if it's trying to do your a great ledger, your accounting, your, your ERP, your sales, and also to be doing whatever else, your project management, it, maybe the project management module is not strong enough for what you're trying to achieve. You know, so you probably often have to still just work on having great system integration so that those systems still communicate well together. Uh, so true. Very important. And, and you've touched another point that I find is important, for example, to have your lean committee and every month you have that cadency in place, that process in place. So it's not like when you feel like it or when you think about it, maybe every six months or something, you, re you do a review of the expenses and see where you can cut or uh, are we working in a lean way? You have baked in the processes that's happening at that regular schedule and cadency going on. Like that. So there's Yeah, a lot and that's that. why lean works so well, because when you go and put together a lean committee or do lean initiatives, you immediately have to explain what the ROI is going to be. So for companies and entrepreneurs that are scared and thinking, oh, they're just going to spend money, they're going to 
redesign something or invest. It's like, wait a sec, no. Well, the whole thing about lean is less, not more. So it's what can we do differently? What we can, can we eliminate first, optimize, and then have some type of return on investment on that. So that's why lean is so effective. Okay. And another big challenge, I believe, in execution, it comes back also to culture and people together. But the execution, unless it's done by robots, most of the time it's done by people. So yeah. you can have all kinds of issues toward accountability. We see that a lot. Like uh, they have good intentions, good people. They say yes, yes, and then they don't do it. Mm-hmm. You know. So how do you handle improving, let's say, accountability for the improvement of execution? We, it's a very, very simple system. We ensure that every single person not only has scorecards, which we spoke about earlier in the podcast, very clear definition of success metrics, responsibilities, and competencies. Then we have maximum of three key objectives. They're always smart objectives per quarter. And we absolutely demand that on a formal basis, every single director or manager meets with their direct report quarterly to go over the scorecard quickly and go over those top three objectives. That's it. You hold them accountable to those. You're constantly having touch points. Obviously, in scaling up, we have a meeting rhythm, right? So in scaling up, we have daily huddles, weekly meetings, monthly sessions, and quarterly planning meetings. So because we have this rhythm of communication that's happening daily, everybody's aware of what others are working on. So it's very hard for you to kind of go off track. You know, you have to be following the vision. You have to be following the plan. You have to be following the company's mission. And so by having that discipline, typically people really stay track on plan. So it's, it's simply like a, a quarterly meeting that you're saying to review those three objectives with the employee. Did you do it? Did you not do it? Exactly. And, and if he's not on track, I guess you're just starting some kind of HR process. Is a first warning. Take this seriously or you're out. Kind of deal. Yeah. Typically, if you've hired the right way and if you're giving the right type of leadership and the right type of guidance, hopefully it doesn't get to that point because, you know, I've never been a big fan of kind of these performance improvement plans. I feel like they're often just the first step to someone being let go. Uh, hopefully, if you're building your team and you're building the culture the right way and you're doing that scorecard uh, in a way that's very fair and that's built with the, the, the employee, you should have be able to avoid those situations. Right, right, right. I was thinking maybe just like a, some kind of a official verbal warning that is documented in the employee's file more than an improvement plan, which is indeed often perceived by some people in the real way that it is, if it's done honestly as an improvement plan and yeah. it's there to help. But yeah, it can sometimes be more of a firing plan. In, yeah, in exactly. some, you some use that pretty quick. Yeah, so it's case by case. Uh, let's let's hope people use it in the, the more fair way. Okay, and, and do you ask them to report more often than just quarterly on this? Yeah, well, you know that's the whole thing with the scaling up is that because you're having these daily huddles and these weekly meetings and even monthly, you know, reviews, you're constantly having a feedback on the priorities. You're going back and forth with it. So you're always aware of what everybody's working. It never really happens that you're in the dark. Right. And let's say the, the those meetings, like the daily huddle, as a company grows, you will change. And if anybody's not doing the daily huddle, I highly suggest it. I've seen a very good improvement company. Then we had stopped doing it for a while. And then we saw, hey, we, we got slower. We started doing it again. So daily huddle is there for, to stay for the long term. That's for sure. Because you pulse faster as a company. You, you talk every morning. And then you unblock anything that needs to, to be unblocked and so on. And as a company is growing, at one point, like, how do you split this? Because the huddle won't make sense if you have like 30 person who needs to speak within 15 minutes. You start by department or how do you split that? It's always by department. So, you know, usually you have your executive strategic team and then they're bringing it into each of their departments. The daily huddle should only last seven minutes, right? It's a good news, what I'm working on and what's holding me back. And that's it. So you're just going through those three things, super clear, super obvious. And then each department, usually a daily huddle will be anywhere between six and 10 people. So, you know, that's the cascade that happens. Normally, when you're a big warehousing company or if you have a lot of people in a, in a you know, shipping department, that you could do one big huddle for 20, 30, 40 people at once. Mm-hmm. You're giving more KPI review and giving them projects for the day. But if not, you know, typically the daily huddle will really be super short, super efficient, and works very well. Okay, so seven minutes. Okay, I had in mind 15. Not too sure why. It's really, we're down to seven now. We're telling people it's got to be fast. You know, it should be 30 seconds per person. Even if you have 10 people in there, that's only five minutes. Right. Uh... Because otherwise it becomes too long for everybody. Everybody's just waiting exactly. around for their turn to come out and then like that long 15 minute boring meeting. Exactly. You know? Okay. Um, yeah, it's interesting stuff. Okay. And the, the weekly meeting is uh, 
do you have multiple of those weekly meetings going on or is this uh, like one per department some kind of executive meeting yeah you could typically have like the scaling up meeting per week but you could also have departmental meetings the scaling up meeting will really all be about again a good news what you're working on and then it'll be employee and customer feedback working on priorities talking a little bit along the way as well about any big topics or challenges that you have as an organization eventually that'll end up cascading down into all the different departments as well Again, the goal of scaling up is not to have more meetings, it's just to have more efficient meetings. So you, you still you have to make sure you're eliminating a lot of a lot of other meetings along the way. Right. Yeah, that's why you're doing this. So like we don't need to have those impromptu meetings that are just like a waste of time or unstructured or don't have an agenda. You say let's just wait for the, the weekly meeting about marketing or whatever, and then let's do it there. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um yeah. So uh, execution, I, I believe, is such a deep topic. We're still saying fairly high level, and, but I, I think it's, it's pretty good coverage. So, um, yeah, we probably won't have enough time to cover the last one here that uh, would have been normally cash, especially if we want to cover it properly. Yeah. But we have covered three of the four pillars today with this uh, first podcast. Maybe I'll, we could just do another episode and bring you back for the, the discussion on the fourth pillar. Yeah, I can tell you that the cash portion could probably take a full hour on its own. So, right, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. So, well, thank you, uh, Sean, for for all those uh, very useful information today. If people want to get in touch with you, how can they find you? Yeah, they can go to two places. They can go to LinkedIn, Sean Johal at LinkedIn. On LinkedIn, you'll find me. I'm the only one with that name, so it's pretty easy. And they probably can go to elevationleaders.com, uh, and you'll find me there and all our information for sure. All right, thank you for being here today, Sean. Thank you, Guillaume. Really appreciate it.